In this video, I'm going to do an EICR on a domestic property. I've been trying to do one on this channel for ages, but unfortunately, I can't seem to get someone to agree to let me do one in their property. And most of my clients have um, terms and conditions where I'm not allowed to do any filming or even take photos of uh, any work I do in their property and put it on any social media or anything like that so I'm a bit stuck for where I can actually carry one out so in the spirit of you should have one of these done when you move into a new property to make sure it's safe I'm going to do one on my place now a bit of a short history about the property the property's three years old it's had one owner so it's not brand new but it's almost new so it should in theory shoot straight through but as always, you can't assume just because something's new, it's done correctly. With no more being said, let's get started and I'll see you in there. Welcome to my place. Now, I've got the installation certificate. Uh, it's not had any ICR done. It was wired from new three years ago and I've got access to the report, uh, the EIC. So what we'll do in the second part of this video is I'll get my EICR and test results and we'll compare them to the people that wired the whole place. I'm not going to name the company that done it, uh, so I'll blank that out. I will show you their schedule of test results, compare it to mine to see how uh, close they are together, to see if they're accurate. Um, my tester was calibrated a week ago, so my tester is perfect. You're going to get accurate results from what I do. So without further ado, let's get started. Shut up and sit down. Okay, if you're gonna do these tests, these are the tools that you'll need. Basic hand tools, an R2 wandering lead. I'll get onto why these are so important as we go on. And last but not least, test equipment. So I use a Fluke 1652. It's a few years old now. I think it's two years old. All your leads. I use an earth leakage clamp meter. I'll show you that a bit later. Voltage tester. Little polarity check for socket outlets. And four awkward light fittings to get readings off. I've got these Qtex light mate i think they're called the light mate if i can remember right but i might be wrong so these are great for avoiding taking down things like chandeliers and awkward lights you don't want to take down but you want to get an earth reading off so what you do is put your earth lead on the metal frame and then you can plug these into the lamp holder and you've got access to the live and neutral and you can do your test shut up and sit down This is my metering equipment outside in the corridor. So that's my cutout. All looks great. No bits of copper poking out. Polarity looks correct. Main isolator looks good. And because the supply from here to the board is over three meters, they need to install switch fuse protection. Not 100% sure what well i am it's going to be 100 amp but for the sake of this video it's not verified what fuse it is so this is our main fuse which is a bs883 80 amp so the metering equipment is all satisfactory and the extra switch fuse protection has been installed correctly uh it's made of combustible material however this cupboard's fire rated in itself so not too worried if this was under a stairs i would expect something like this to be uh, made of non-combustible material so metal but uh, i'm quite happy with this i'll also grab a quick earth leakage reading of the whole property just so i know what sort of leakage is present at the moment 
You'd think I'd take my rubbish out before, wouldn't you? <sighs> right, the first thing I do on any EICR is what I call the lap. So working clockwise or anti-clockwise with the fuse board or mains intake, whatever I feel like. I'll just walk, this time I'm gonna go clockwise. So I'll walk around the place in a clockwise manner and just see if I can see anything that I'm not sure I like. So this is the bathroom. I'll scope all the walls, go in cupboards, no electricity while well, there's heating controls here. Now I think we might have a deviation here, but this is something I'll have to come back to. We've got an extract fan in this bathroom that isn't fused down with a three amp spur. However, this maker fan might not need it. I've not installed a Vortis before. I've not read the manufacturer's instructions. So we'll come back to that later to see if it requires three amp fuse protection or not. Bathroom lights IP rated and suitable for the zone it's in. So, so far so good. Again, walk round, checking for damaged accessories, things like that. Now, when it comes to sockets and switches behind furniture, some of them you're not gonna to get to, but you see here, there's some sockets behind this uh, set of drawers, which I'm gonna move. So that's easily movable. So I'm gonna get behind them and inspect them socket outlets into the lounge now. Again, walking about checking to see if there's any cracks or heat marks on any of the accessories. So when you come to furniture like this, this big wardrobe, that there's no way I'm gonna be able to move that or I'm willing to move it on an EICR test. So I'll have to mark down on my paperwork as a limitation if there's any sockets or switches behind there that I can't get to. In this case, I know for a fact there's no sockets or switches behind there, so not really applicable. Again, walking round, there's sockets behind this amp, but I can easily move that, so that's good. There's sockets there I can access, sockets there. And finally, we're back, from the, we're back to the start. Time for the big reveal. Okay, not too bad. It looks like it was done uh, professionally. Um, I like how they've tried to use the tail clamps. <laughs> it's a 16 mil twin and a half supply from the cupboard in the communal area. So it's a 16 mil twin and a half. That is not quite clamping them cables. They're made for 16 and 25 mil uh, double insulated tails. So I like how they've made the effort, but I don't quite think it's clamping them, but never mind. Uh, Face value, no sign of thermal damage to anything. Uh, 13th edition, uh, 13th edition, 17th edition, amendment three fuse board, so it's made of metal, which is good. Dual RCD, yeah, looks pretty good so far. I'm not sure I like the fact that they've not used grommet strip where the cables enter. You can see a cable rubbing across the metal enclosure. Um, this time it's a earth wire that's rubbed against it, so there's no live conductors rubbed against it, so I'm not too worried. Uh, there's one in the corner there, but I don't think it's trapped, so yeah. Not great, I'd have liked to have seen some grommet strip on that, but Meh. Another potential cause for concern is the 16mm twin and CPC cable coming into the property and how it's run. Now the cable's not protected by a 30mm RCD, it's going inside a wall, however, it could be buried in this wall at a depth greater than 50mm, so that would comply, but in this case, I'm not quite sure, I can't quite see the depth of the wall so that'll have to be i'll probably note that but be marked as a limitation shut up and sit down
Shut up and sit down. Okay, here we are at the main bonding to the gas. Uh, there's no water bond because the incoming and all water pipes are plastic, so this is the only bonding conductor we need to be concerned with. Uh, just done a quick test, put in it so it's a nice and tight, clamps nice and tight. So let's go ahead and do the R2 test from the MET to the gas bond. Just going to do a quick test again to the actual pipe to make sure that the clamp itself is uh, actually attached properly. Yep, bounced around for a while but got exactly the same reading. And that is why it's so important to go around to appliances and check there are two continuities. So I've got a fault on at my place. You can't see me, but I'm touching the earth um, cooker behind the camera. Oh dear, 120 volts to earth. That's naughty. So I've not got a R2 reading at this big metal extract hood, but if you can see on this label here at the top, you can see the two squared sign for double insulation. So this extract hood meets the requirements for double insulation and an earth to the metal frame is not required. Shut up and sit down. The next test to do is ring continuity between each socket circuit in the property. So here we're going to be doing end-to-end -end tests between the live, neutral and CPC conductors. You can do this at the fuse board or at a socket outlet. I like to do it at socket outlets, A, because it gets me visually inspecting behind some accessories, and B, because it makes it easy to do the figure of eight test, uh, which is following past the ring continuity test. It's really important to do the figure of eight test, in my opinion, because it helps you find any spurs or spur of spurs. So if you get a high reading at a socket outlet when you're doing your figure of eight test, it's a good idea to take that socket front off and see what's going on behind it. So here we go. I've taken a socket front off. I've vision inspected behind it as well. Couldn't see any cause for concern. I must see where my leads first. Look at that. High R1 continuity. Let's have a look at the second one. That's a bit better. So we had 0 0.49 for the neutrals. Uh, let's say in an ideal world, the live should be 0 0.49 as well, but we've got a loose connection somewhere. But the line of neutral conductors are 2.5 millimeters squared with the CPC being 1.5 mil squared. So we would expect the CPC readings to be 1.67 times higher than the line and neutral. So we'll take our neutral continuity we got, times it by 1.67. So we are expecting a reading of 0 0.8182 around that area for the CPC conductors. You can see I've got a reading way below that. Um, this doesn't cause me any concern because 
In this circuit, the boiler is connected into the ring that I'm testing, and that's got a 10 millimeter earth bond going back to the MET. So we're experiencing parallel pass here. This is no cause for concern. Point two six for line. Point two two for neutral, not far out. Mm, a little low again um, I'm not too worried again because there may be parallel paths but I'm not sure where we're we'll picking this one up from we'll keep an eye out for that using a couple of connectors I've uh, prepared the figure of eight tests without going live with incoming earth and outgoing earth with incoming live so we need to add our uh, R1 reading with our R2 reading and then divide by four and that should be the true r1 r2 we should be getting a reading from each socket outlet so we should be getting a reading of around 0 0.15 good good a bit higher but okay we'll see if i can change that by reinserting there you go sometimes you'll get dust and things in the contacts or the switch can become sticky so if you ever get a high reading just do what I did exactly that and see if you can bring it down to what it should be and if you can't then it might be time to take that front off but here it was just perhaps a bit of dust in the contacts as I said before so I brought that down that is good and that's a great lesson to remember if you ever come across high readings at socket outlets shut up and sit down the next test on the to-do list is the insulation resistance test commonly referred to as Megarin the installation this is a potentially dangerous test if you don't do it right. It can also have disastrous consequences if you don't take the correct precautions. You could end up shoving a voltage down the installation with equipment plugged in that could become permanently damaged because you didn't carry out the right steps. I always do, and you should too, I always do live and neutral cross connected together and test at earth if you test between live conductors that's when you could start damaging people's equipment it's also a good idea to make sure your uh, client is somewhere not near any electrical equipment because if you shove a voltage down it and they're touching a earthed piece of equipment they could get a uh, nasty electric shock from your multimeter uh, I always do the board as a whole. It is better practice to do each circuit individually, but I always do it this way to save a bit of time and it will always get you the worst reading as well. So if you get a reading that's not satisfactory, then I would suggest you take the each circuit apart and do them individually, but that can be quite hard work sometimes depending on what fuse board you come across and the state of it. So I'm going to do my board as a whole, otherwise known as doing it globally. So let me get set up and I'll show you how to do it. Right, so I've set it up. You can see the main switch is off, the RCDs are off. I've left the MCBs up and I've cross-connected all line and neutral conductors in the installation. When you do this to start off with, make sure you're not testing straight away at 500 volts. Start at 100 if you can or start at 250 volts because if there's a fault on and you get it at 250 volts 
it's not as likely to cause damage as what 500 would. So 100 to 250 first, if that's clear, then test at 500 and record your reading at 500 volts. Shut up and sit down. The final tests that need to be carried out are the R1, R2 readings of each circuit and the earth fault loop impedance ZS readings. <coughs> we carry out these tests to ensure that each protective device of each circuit is going to disconnect in a timely fashion in the event of any fault. Next I'll carry out RCD tests to make sure they're operating correctly. A lot of safety factors are placed on RCDs for newer installations, so it's important to make sure they're operating correctly.